It's called by many the dirtiest oil in the world. Critics allege the crude Canada produces from its tar sands in Alberta comes at a heavy environmental cost. The oil is extracted from a sludge using methods that activists say is destroying the landscape and polluting rivers. Now, an online campaign in Canada is urging people around the world to observe June 18th as Stop the Tar Sands Day. Take a look at this particular screen I have here. It shows you um, the size of these Athabasca oil sands. It's a very significant piece of land, and I just want to play this video that gives some additional visual context to what we're talking about. This is what large areas of northern Alberta look like after the earth is scooped up to be mined for oil. The crude deposits cover an area approximately the size of England. In addition to this obviously um, you know, barren landscape, and, and, and to give perspective, a lot of this land is land that was used, uh, actually forest. Uh, they had to cut down trees and clear a lot of area for this, but there's more than simply that. If you'll take a look at this image I'm pulling up here in my screen, this is of a fish if you can take a look a little bit closer, you'll see that he has got two mouths, a lower jaw and a second lower jaw. Activists say that carcinogens have been dumped into the rivers. It's destroying the fish and it's making local communities sick. Joining us now via Skype from Ottawa to give us some more perspective on this is Canadian Indigenous activist Clayton Thomas Muller, who organizes communities against tar, sand, oil. Clayton, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the stream. How long has this been an issue in Canada? Well, <clears throat> I think that the trajectory of tar sands, you know, being an economically viable form of, uh, you know, economic development for Canada uh, can be followed directly at par with the, you know, violence going on in the Gulf. Um, you know, with destabilization of OPEC producing regions and driving up the international price of oil, it's made this extremely energy and water and social capital intensive form of development economically viable. When oil is trading above $55 per barrel, um, you know, they can actually make money off of this. Um, it's, it's not even proper, though, to call it oil. It's an entirely different classification of fossil fuel unto itself and essentially represents truly the scraping of the bottom of the barrel of, uh, of peak oil production globally. Now, you make an interesting point about how the, lo the uh, current global trends affect, affect the price because, as we understand, it takes about two to three uh, barrels of oil is the cost to produce a barrel, two or three dollars per barrel um, in Saudi Arabia, but it's thirty dollars per barrel in, uh, for these tar sands. So it's only when it's costing sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety dollars a barrel that it becomes profitable. What's the impact that this is having on indigenous communities? Well, the impacts are many. I mean, many local community leaders, you know, ha through common sense and traditional ecological knowledge can put two and two together. As indigenous peoples uh, living in the north who heavily subsidize their diet off of country foods, in other words, foods from the lands, um, you know, communities like Fort Chippewan, 250 kilometers downstream from the Athabasca uh, tar sands boomtown, Fort McMurray, have experienced tremendous rates of cancer and autoimmune deficiencies. And this is a sleepy village of predominantly uh, Aboriginal people, about 1,200 people, who have seen over 100 deaths, health-related deaths, in the last decade, um, you know, which many feel are, are linked to tar sands and their toxic footprint in their lands. Now, Clayton, I want to play a video. I want you to hear this audio, and I'm going to pose you a question based upon it. This is a protest in 2009 that took place in London but it was made by a native Canadian. And just remind BP that we're humans, we're beautiful people, and we have the moral high ground by being here today doing this public protest and reminding BP of their responsibilities to quit drilling in indigenous lands across the world, to quit drilling in Canada, to pull out and take, make the right choice and get out of Canada's tar sands. Okay, so basically, the question here is, she's talking about British Petroleum, BP. This is in 2009, and her concern about BP's efforts in oil sands. We saw with the BP oil spill last year, massive global attention around the issue. But people have argued that the area of impact and the number of people impacted by the mining of Canadian oil sands is much greater than the impact of the BP oil spill. Why do you think this is not getting more mainstream media coverage? Well, first of all, you know, I think comparing the tragedy of the Gulf Coast to the tragedy that is unfolding in the Canadian North um, should never happen. I think that, you know, what the Gulf Coast disaster that happened under BP's watch 
represents is a, 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 a systemic issue with big oil. Um, time and time again, whether it's in Nigeria, whether it's in the Amazon, uh, you know, at the hands of Chevron, or whether it's in the Gulf Coast or in Alberta at the hands of Shell or BP or any other of the global operators, big oil has proven time and time again that they externalize so many of the costs onto local communities just so that their shareholders can continue to make profit. And that includes worker safety, that includes pipeline safety, and, and just op operational site safety. And we've seen time and time again, you know, our water, our earth, and our air sacrifice just so that you know shareholders can continue to make profits uh, you know led by the decisions of irresponsible management of these transnational firms like British Petroleum you know um, I want to I want to get Jillian in here because Clayton raises a really interesting point that this is a global issue this happens all over the place uh, he raised the point about the Ogoni Delta in Nigeria and the impact multiple oil spills have had there you know 40 percent from what we've read 40 percent of Canada's oil exports uh, exports are coming from coal sands. Right. They have the largest reserve of coal sands, I believe, in the world. It's the second largest oil, largest oil reserves after Saudi Arabia. When there's so much money at stake, how can people strive to deal with the environmental question? Well, this is a difficult one, and I think that you know we've got to look to alternative uh, alternative forms of energy. But you know, I'm no expert on this subject. I'm really interested in listening to all of this because I think that. Like you said, it's really a global issue that we really should all be kind of trying well, to engage I, I, in. Well, the reason I ask you is because of your work in dealing with sure. issues of freedom of expression and freedom of speech. Right. But you have a situation here where, there, I mean, the mainstream media in Canada is not adequately reporting on this, and it seems that it's not simply an area where right. the government is saying you can't talk about this, right. but if no one is going to raise a mainstream voice, it's almost like another way of curtailing speech. Well, it's complicated when you get small groups, small you know, community organizing groups up against big companies because mm -hmm. then we see what happens when, when that's the situation. Well, you know, speaking of it being a global issue and conversations not happening enough in the mainstream media about this subject, we have TJS Desmog is saying Canada has actually been falsifying, as you've said, its greenhouse gas emissions to hide the tar sands boom. So my question to you is, do you think that social media has a role to play in, and what is that role to fill mm -hmm. the void? Absolutely, social media uh, plays a critical role, I think, in social movements that are happening today to hold big oil accountable, to hold governments that big oil has taken over, like our, our own local Harper uh, government here in Canada, who's completely in bed with big financial institutions and big oil, all in the interests of, of moving tar sands. You know, recently in Bonn, Germany, Canada was, was, was whiplashed by multiple nation states over its decision to keep tar sands emissions out of their official UN report on Canada's uh, emissions reductions. So Canada has become a rogue state of sorts, a petro state, um, I would go as far to say. And I think that what social media has done for grassroots driven campaigns to internationalize this issue and to really draw attention to the plight of local frontline communities who are experiencing the brunt of these impacts, it's punched a hole into the mainstream media and I think there's two pieces here that we need to understand. Clayton, before you go to that actually I'm going to ask you to stay with us into the post show because we want to get deeper into that and we also want to know why you think the June 18th protest can make a difference. We're going to ask you to stay with us. Jillian, thanks for being with us as always. We're going to continue this in the post show. Well, remember you can learn more about the Canadian tar sands issue on Al Jazeera's documentary series Witness which will air the film till the last drop. On June 22nd, make sure to tune in for that. In the meantime, we will continue this online, stream.aljazeera.com. Tweet us at AJStream. We'll see you online.